Welcome to the Weekly Canadian Culture Wars Report. My name is Shannon Boche. I am. Uh, I completed my cross country trip uh, over the last couple of days, uh, driving from Ottawa to New Brunswick. I'm spending the weekend here with family, and uh, I'm not in my usual studio. So, uh, shooting from the car, I'm here with my co-host Melanie Bennett. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to all our new subscribers. Um, it really makes a difference in the algorithm if you're watching and, and you like the content to uh, subscribe and give us a like or a comment. Um, we had a lot of traction on Melanie's video from last week while I was uh, uh, down with COVID. And we've got three uh, stories that we're going to talk about in this week's episode. Uh, Melanie, can you give us an outline of uh, of the three topics we're going to cover this week? Yep. Today, we are going to talk about a BC Human Rights Commission complaint against Ezra Levant, which is going to be very interesting, featuring a very prominent trans activist that I'm sure we all know. I'm going to discuss a little bit about Faye Johnstone, Wisdom to Action, Queer Momentum, sort of the change of tactics or what appears to be a change of, uh, change of heart in activism on that end. And we'll also be talking about school enrollment and what's going on with EQAO or um, achievements uh, in school. So I'll have those three stories for today. I think we should start with the Ezra Levant story. So you sent me a link earlier this week about the BC Human Rights Commission. So a complaint was made by trans activist Jessica Yaniv, who's now, I believe, Jessica Simpson, who We'll get his real his real name is John. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, he's a trans person and trans activist. Uh, got into a lot of controversy. Has been reasonably famous for these said controversies. Uh, complained about Rebel News and Ezra Levant. I think maybe even specifically in 2021, and that BC Human Rights Commission complaint is surfaced only very very recently. So I think we should start. With that story, and you used to have a bit more in the ins and outs of it, uh, Shannon. Yeah, well, first of all, it speaks a little bit to the backlog. That's something that happened, you know, in back in in middle of 2021. We're going back several years. Um, how many complaints the BC Human Rights Commission must be dealing with? Because if they're just getting to it now, several years down the road, uh, it tells you how uh, some of these, uh, you know, how uh, overrun. Uh, these human rights tribunals and commissions are with complaints. And that's the same thing in Ontario. Uh, they're going to try and attribute some of it to a COVID backlog, but uh, they they really, um, you know, it's it's a socialist I mean, it bureaucracy. Could be it could be slow bureaucracy. It could be the number of cases. It could be a lot of things. Now, Levant called the Ontario, or not Ontario, the BC Human Rights Commission, the person who sent him the notice, and he recorded the phone call in, in a very, very patient and methodical way. We're going to put in a short clip of that and link you to um, the YouTube video where you can listen to the, the conversation yourself. And he, he's very, very patient, uh, a, a very um, uh, methodical with how he's constructing his uh, his argument. He, he knows where he's going with the, the whole conversation. Um, and he's getting clarification and getting the person on the other end of the phone to kind of get things on the record. Um, Jonathan Yaniv is a serial litigator and is constantly in court. Uh, the last couple times he's been in court has been uh, because of criminal charges. And um, he was convicted of assault, I think, against uh, Billboard Chris. Uh, so Chris and, and Yaniv had some run-ins a couple of years ago, and uh, Jonathan Yaniv was trying to get uh, women who uh, have small private aesthetics practices to wax his uh, berries. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the human rights. BC Human Rights Commission complaints. Oh, he he he! Every one of these women, and often their 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 little aesthetics practices in their home, um, and so he was going into their homes, booking uh, uh, a, a a genital waxing uh, as a woman, and showing up and being a a male bodied person, and then he, he won would. That one. So yeah, they were no no they had to. So no I... no. Oh, he lost it. I'm obviously he, not following very closely. And it and it's not just one. Every 
every esthetician that he went to, he filed human rights complaints against the, who, okay. who wouldn't. And these typically these are, um, uh, you know, they're they're a Asian minority women, um, and they might be at home by themselves, you know, where the spouse is working or what have you. And so they they had safety concerns, and he tried to get the BC Human Rights Commission to, uh, you know, go after these women and and to basically try and extort them. And so, that's so we get. Here. I mean, I I don't follow the very closely the stories, but didn't he also have controversies around inviting young girls, and by young girls I mean like maybe twelve year olds or something like that, to pool parties where you'd encourage them to swim topless. Like he's been involved yes. in a, he's also had some tiffs with uh, Blair White, I think. Some yeah. tiffs with Blair White. He's had uh, a lot of controversies. He was one of the, the really nasty trans activists on Twitter before Elon Musk bought it, who would go after people for misgendering him, using the wrong pronouns, dead naming him. And he's responsible for having, um, I, I'm going to say dozens of, people banned from Twitter uh, with his human rights, uh, you know, uh, false allegations and histrionic claims about his feelings um, and, and so-called rights. You know, he's one of those people who throws around things like hate speech and, and, and uh, transphobia and, and uh, an absolute nut bar. Uh, and now this, and now a 2021 BC human rights complaint by Jessica Simpson, Yaniv, whatever his name is currently, maybe it's different, who knows? Um, and now this this complaint shows up, what, three years later. Um, and so, yeah, let's get back to Ezra, Ezra's response and that call. Well, I, I found it really interesting because, as I said, <coughs> <clears throat> sorry, uh, as I said, he was very methodical in building his argument. Uh, and getting the person on the other end of the phone to uh, to kind of, you know, give an explanation of why this was moving forward. He asked the person if they were familiar with Jessica Yaniv, Jonathan Yaniv's history of uh, being a serial litigator, asked why this complaint was coming forward. And in in the human rights tribunals and commissions, they're designed to protect people from discrimination based on protected characteristics. So in Ontario, the list of, of, of areas for discrimination are uh, memberships, like in unions or clubs or, or those sorts of things, in contracts, in housing, in employment. And I always leave one out. Someone's going to tell me. But basically, you're not allowed to deny someone access to services. That's the other. Um, uh, or or opportunities in housing, employment, et cetera, because of their uh, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, race, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you're not a white male, because no one, you can't discriminate against white males, according to these tri tribunals, because we, we're the we're the uh, oppressor class, um, and we get we get everything easy in our lives. Uh, so Levant is trying to build this argument. Uh, and he's saying, well, you know, can you under, can you explain to me? Because, you know, we're, we're, a, a, I'm a journalist. Rebel News is a journalist publication. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand how this complaint can be justified because we don't have a business relationship with Yaniv. We haven't denied him housing. We're not denying him services or anything like that. So how does it, how does this even form, um, the basis of complaint? And what came out was that there's, there's a little, used clause in the BC Human Rights Commission around publication. And it's a censorship clause that uh, the BC Human Rights Commission has assumed that they are uh, legitimate arbiters of, of speech that could, uh, and, you know, create hate against somebody. Uh, Ezra's got better language for that. And so he's saying, oh, you're going after me for this uh, this draconian speech laws under, and, and you think that you've got the right to do that. So to me, there was two interesting things at the end of the video. Yeah. Um, one was this 
the speech law piece. And the other was, he said, we're going to, we're going to try this in two ways. One, of course, is you're going to go through your process, but we're going to, we're going to try this in the court of public opinion as we do it. Uh, and, uh, and then the other interesting thing at the end was this person's name, and I was looking at it on the video, is Daniel uh, something, uh, and sounds very much like a woman. And I thought so as well, yeah. Uh, right, and, and at the end, Ezra says, well, okay, can you, uh, you know, I don't want to, I, I want to know how to properly address you. And, and I don't know if, you know, based on your name, if you're a man, if you're a woman, how I should, <laughs> you know. And, and at Rebel News, they don't mess around, right? Like, he's just going to call Jonathan Yaniv a he, and he did so through the whole call. Um, but he he made sure that he got at this this person who sounds very much like a middle midlife woman uh, to say that... He, She's a man. Anyway, it's 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 all it's all kind of fishy and, and gross. <laughs> what, so the interesting thing that you just said, I, I I listened to it once, and I don't think I picked up on this, but um, I certainly picked up on what you were saying just now, that the BC Human Rights Commission is using a sort of loophole to control speech, as it were. So in a nutshell. And then that raises some interesting questions about whether, so the Bill C-63, which I guess we could colloquially call the hate speech bill, it went through a second reading. Um, so it's still on the cards. It could still happen. And this bill is thought to be designed to control people's speech, to, to even control people who may say something that is deemed hateful in the future. It lo loosely defines hate speech. So then it it raises the question of whether or not the intent is for the human rights commissions of different provinces then to be used as regulators of speech in this particular way, because it seems BC is often, or seems to me, BC is often at the forefront, the vanguard of this, these new progressive radical ways yeah. of conducting oneself here in Canada. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just a curious, curious thought I had when you were explaining that. I don't know if that's uh, intentional or if it's just because BC is so bloody woke. Uh, I, I, and I suspect it's the latter. Um, the, uh, you know, what we saw with Bill C-16, which is what launched Jordan Peterson into uh, international fame and all the early controversies back in 2016, that was what we call the uh, compelled speech bill. Um, and that was the uh, the pronoun inclusion, the gender identity inclusion into the federal human rights uh, legislation. But the provinces had already all put in those speech codes into their human rights legislation. So it was kind of a, you know, a, a bottom up, at least legislatively, uh, from the provinces to the federal. So I think at some point we should talk about C sixty three that bill that's going to second reading the uh, the censorship bill the yeah. misinformation disinformation bill, but it's probably too much for this week's episode. Yeah, uh, and and it's worth reading into again before we we give a rundown on it. So keep your eyes open for uh, what's going on with Ezra Levant. Uh, I'll say one more thing about Yaniv. Um, recently, Drea Humphreys, she's fantastic. She's a Western Canada reporter for uh, Rebel News. Um, has been um, assault, not assaulted, but um, stalked by Yaniv, even to the extent that he's threatening her children. Uh, he's a really nasty piece of work. He is, yeah. he is a, a, an, an extraordinary um, a narcissist in, in, in the diagnostic sense of the word, narcissistic personality disorder. He exhibits um, a bunch of the the traits. There's nine traits of narcissistic personality disorder. They're very easily identifiable with this guy. If you have five or more traits, you're you would fit into the you know the diagnostic criteria. Anyhow, so that that's kind of it for uh, for that topic this week. As I said, keep your eyes open for that story as it unfolds over the next little while because uh, it, it'll be entertaining. Uh, Ezra Levant and Rebel News they they make. Uh, uh, you know, for good uh, entertainment and satire, and uh, um, we'll see how it unfolds in the coming months. 
Okay, so let's pivot a little bit and talk about Faye Johnstone, which we like to talk about a fair bit on this channel. Now, Faye Johnstone is also a pretty well-known uh, trans activist who has been nasty in the past, specifically towards TERFs or people that Faye and the certain crowd of trans activists uh, disagree with on uh, trans kids or trans issues or, or women's sports or whatever. And I'll, I'm just going to read a few tweets that have come out from Faye Johnson that I guess yep. are passed around fairly yep. regularly just to illustrate that Faye could also be pretty nasty. So let me, let me just jump in and give a yeah. little bit more background on Faye for people who might not know. So uh, Faye, I think is... Uh, his birth name is Brian. He's from Ottawa. Isn't it Zach? Zach. Zach. I, I, I don't know why I call him Brian. It must be another GP trans person. So Zach um, Johnstone uh, is uh, a well-funded and well-connected trans activist who um, has been involved with uh, organizations like, uh, what is it, uh, Queer Momentum, well, he he's he runs Queer Momentum, which is a new one, and then the one before that was Wisdom to Action, and I think right. he's been a sort of involved in nonprofit trans activism for some time before that. Yeah, but they he's not an yet lot of federal funding. An awful like in the in the north of Millions. of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and is uh, has figured out that grant process and figured out that the federal government is pouring uh, all these millions into uh, advancing the cause of of uh, queer. Uh, trans um, and yeah, is, is talk about in a little bit too. Yeah, playing playing in the annual uh, twenty million dollar uh, reality TV show prize for the biggest victim uh, in Canada. Yeah. Okay. Well, Faye over the years has been known to say some pretty horrific things and be particularly nasty towards towards people, like I mentioned. And and so let me just read a few tweets, which I'll put up on the screen here. Here we have in 2022, uh, I know that despite their claims, TERFs are agents of patriarchy and white supremacy. They're recruiters for the far right. Uh, they're not unwelcome because of their genders. They're unwelcome because of their bigotry. I actually do want a political environment in which TERFs are so vilified that they don't dare speak their views publicly, let alone act on them. Shut them down. So this is what we're used to from Faye Johnstone. Uh, but if anyone has been paying attention to Faye Johnstone over some time, when he goes on to public appearances or on CPAC, he, he sort of has an affectation of a much nicer person, even though I have, I have a picture here of Faye, I think it was last year at Capital Pride with his t-shirt saying, protect trans kids with the knife on. And so there's always this underlining, uh, uh, sorry, underlying threat coming from yeah. Faye Johnstone. It, it's a, a threat towards anyone who is not on board with what we're doing. And there's a lot of uh, talk about threats to the community. So then I, I think that justifies the threats that they make towards other people, but they wouldn't see it that way. So why am I bringing up the way that Faye is, right? Because we know that trans activists can sometimes behave in this way. Well, in March of 2024, so just at the turn of last, uh, last year in the winter, I spent a lot of time trying to find out what trans activists were doing in Canada. And I came across a lecture or a speech or an event that he, uh, Faye Johnstone went to is the Community Based Research Center. And as far as I can tell, that's a sexuality based nonprofit in Vancouver. And in that speech, I was interested to hear Faye Johnstone have what appeared to be a change of heart in some respects. So I'll link this so you could go listen to it for yourself. But in that speech, uh, Faye was basically saying, you know, as we expect, there's a rising tide of hate. You know, the far right is winning. And so they need to change their tactics uh, that really what they needed to do is stop shouting people down. And they really needed to be nice to PPC supporters or parents' rights supporters, because he noticed that calling them hateful bigots wasn't really getting them where they wanted to go. So they were sort of losing. Um, he, he did bemoan how racially diverse the Million March for Children was. So this was obviously after the Million March for Children. And he says that that made them look bad uh, and that they weren't intersectional enough. So there was a lot of interesting things in this discussion. He also tried, uh, tried a, to- a lot, of white, a lot of white males with blue hair. Right, <laughs> right. In, in, in there, he also tried to blame 
uh, far right bigots for manipulating the poor migrants to join into this tactic. So it wasn't really, so they didn't really understand. It was really those far right bigots that are bringing them along. And so we had to not treat them meanly. We had to stop calling them names because they were just being manipulated. So there's a lot of things like that. He also pointed out in March 2024 that talking about parental rights was a losing game for, for the trans activists because it was a, a seductive idea and everybody wants parents to have rights because they want parents to protect their own children. So there was a lot of inter interesting things in this particular uh, session. But it was also intermixed with a lot of, yeah, but the bigots kind of deserve it and we're kind of right. And, you know, it's just that they're changing tactics and maybe we need to think about changing tactics. So I was very curious about that call when it happened. I put out some tweets about it and I forgot about it. And then very, very recently, in there's a series of Zoom calls that Faye is, in, is, is doing, putting out, I guess, over the upcoming elections and some other uh, nonprofit reasons. So it's giving training to other nonprofits and other uh, people interested in queer activism. And one of the topics was essentially how to escape the echo chamber that they're in so that they could win hearts and minds. And I thought this was a really interesting call. It was two hours long. And and I, again, I'll put a link in. Melanie doesn't watch movies or or, uh, or, no. or or binge on TV shows. This is this is what Melanie watches. Yeah, it's pretty much what I watch. But so, but this this particular Zoom call was very very interesting because through through it all, I would say that I actually agreed with ninety percent of what Faye said in this Zoom call. He completely changed his tone for the most part, and it would give you the impression that. So, so let me give a bit of an overview of, of this two hours. He talks about how the, the, the queer community has noticed this backlash, right? So what they call the rising tide of hate, I suppose you could call they're, they're losing ground, they're losing sympathy. So he's noticed that this is happening. He's also, again, reiterating that we really need to stop shouting people down as transphobic bigots all the time because it's not helping uh, them be sympathetic towards us. He talks a lot about bridging gaps about meeting people where they are, you know, trying to engage in good faith, use like stop using uh, ideological language like cis heteronormative, start, you know, using the nor normal language that people let will understand. And I'm hearing all this. I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. Faye has had a change of heart. He understands that we need to treat people more respectfully, but not really. Not really, because what this kind of is, it's not so much that Johnstone is interested in actually meeting people where they are it's more that Faye is interested in finding better strategic ways or tactics to get people to believe what he believes right, right? and so anyway that was really interesting and then um i noticed that there was an article going around so i'm do i am going to do a bit of reading because I, I just think this turn this turn is very interesting and we need to be aware of it is not what it appears and it's quite manipulative. So there's an article that came out in Extra Magazine and in that article is very much aligned with what I'm saying and it describes this change of heart very, very well. Okay, so he says, in order to push back, we need to develop a stronger collective and capacity to engage in education, coalition building, solidarity work with communities that have been specifically targeted, blah, blah, blah. So we know we know we, there's a pushback and we really need to develop better skills because who knew that shouting people down wasn't really going to be very effective in the long run. To some readers of Extra, this may seem like common sense. To others, it's likely, that, uh, it's likely to feel very much at odds with the popular social justice culture of the past decade because we know social justice culture has been shouting people down for the past decade. A decade ago, my own younger radical queer activist self would have found it unthinkable that I would ever embrace such an idea. They're talking about, you know, bridging gaps, meeting people there, good faith, uh, good faith engagement. I probably would have denounced it as mealy mouthed liberalism. Yet today, as a slightly older radical queer, I'm convinced that finding a way to persuade those who fear us that we're not, in fact, so different after all, is the only way for us to win the future that we long for, a future that is safer and more just for everyone. Again, that sounds kind of good. It's like, okay, you're maturing. You should do that because, you know, shouting again, shouting people down and, you know, saying you don't believe what I believe. So you're a terrible person. It's not winning. But it goes on. Popular social justice discourse throughout the 2010s 
was dominated by a particular style of identity-focused intersectional feminism, a style that many young millennial, millennial cultural workers, writers, media makers uh, were part of articulating. For many in the trans and, uh, trans and queer people within this milieu, the notion of educating others out of prejudice came to be seen not as an effective, ineffective strategy for social um, and, and strategy for social change, but antithetical to the project of liberation, entirely because of the burden it places on us to act as ad hoc ambassadors for our entire communities. The sentiment is, it's not my job to educate you, became common refrain among us, as did certain resistance to the idea of doing emotional labor. Why would we want to do emotional labor for you? Um, and so we're here, we're describing, well, we never did this in the past. We used to think, we just shout you down and say, I'm not doing your emotional labor, educate yourself. You know, that sort of milieu that, uh, that was very common. We didn't want to, we didn't want to engage with people because that's terribly liberal. And then it, it goes on to say, for, the, for those of us who identify as activists, advocates, culture workers, and social change makers, so the people who get funding from the federal government, like Wisdom to Action, who we're talking about here, for those of us who identify as activists, advocates, cultural workers, and social change makers, educating others purposefully, persuasively, uh, and, and well is actually an essential part of the job description. So now, so now they're saying it, this is part of the job description. Oh, they yeah. figured it out. So it's one of the most important capacities for trans rights advocates and allies to develop. I'm just going to read a little bit more. Speaking to Faye Johnstone, this is a quote from Faye Johnstone. I love speaking with people who challenge me, Johnstone says. It shows me where they are. They, we often tell people to give us the benefit of the doubt and to believe that we are who we say we are. And for many straight cis people, their biological sex is how they understand their gender identity. If we're asking people for the benefit of the doubt about who we are, we need to give them the benefit of the doubt to tell us about how they understand themselves. So that is completely at odds with the beginning, basically saying we need to shut up those turfs. We need to tell them what to yeah. do. we're under attack. It's so completely different. Okay, and it seems like he's matured, right? This seems so, oh, it's nice. You actually yeah. want to meet people where they are. But my, if you go back to the videos uh, of the training sessions, there's still this language of having to sort of like be a kinder, you know, more um, uh, middle of the road engagement with people. But Johnstone always talks about how this is a tactic. It's a strategy. Mm -hmm. This is not really about genuinely caring about how you understand yourself and meeting in the middle. This is a strategy to still get what they want. But anyway, this is what I thought was really interesting. We're seeing a divergence from this sort of, I'm not here to educate you. I'm not here to yeah. blah, 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 blah. To, I'm oh, they don't like it. So we're just going to be a bit nicer. <clears throat> but keep in mind that this is still very, very, very manipulative. Now, the last thing I wanted to say about this is that uh, Mia Ashton did notice this article and has posted about it and has offered uh, a olive branch to Faye Johnstone to actually have a public debate. I would love to see that happen. Uh, and I think yes. if Faye Johnstone is serious about bridging gaps, he should take that opportunity. <laughs> I, I cannot see it happening. Uh, some some uh, people were fantasizing online about having Jonathan Kay moderate that discussion, um, and uh, you know because they're both uh, both Faye and uh, and Mia, who's now I noticed going by Maria Hughes uh, on Twitter, not Mia Ashton anymore. Which is you know it's nice that her her persona and her uh, and her you know um, you know her real life self can can merge finally after uh, you know years of cancellation attacks now i there's a couple things <clears throat> i'm curious about who wrote that article for extra this person well, i can give you their name i think they're a trans activists it's a person called kai cheng palm okay i don't know the, re uh, the reason i ask is that a couple of months ago adam zivo from the national post put up a somewhat sympathetic piece towards the, the, that same cohort of people uh, saying, and he quoted the same thing, it's not my job to educate you. And he said, these are the things that are not working. And when you were reading that, that paragraph, that it reminded me exactly of what Adam Zivo said. And Adam is, I would say he's slightly right of center. He's a gay man. 
um, and and a great writer. He's been instrumental in raising awareness about the opioid crisis and the problem with safer supply or safe supply or whatever it is. Um, so he's one of this new uh, uh, generation of great journalists at National Post. Now, the second thing, and I, I talked about narcissism and pathological narcissism in our last segment about Jonathan Yaniv. And you may be familiar with this in a couple of different um, contexts, but the stereotypical or the prototypical abusive male power dynamic in a relationship uh, is is uh, often, it's a simplistic one. And it is, um, there's like a, a, a rising tension and then there's an explosion of some sort and, and the abuse is conducted and carried out. And then uh, the their victims push back in some sense. They threaten to leave. They, you know, uh, you know, start mobilizing a defense against the abuser. And then the abuser shifts tactics in, into what what we call love bombing. Well, St. John Stone tells you himself this is a shifting tactic. Exactly. He doesn't say it publicly, but he says that in his meetings. Exactly. So I, you know, I have a a, a low level of confidence that someone like Faye, who's participating in a, in a distributed uh, pathological narcissism at scale. So he, he's behaving it, a, a, along his own ideological lines. So this is not yes. about actually reaching out to people and meeting them where they are. Like I said, this is about how do we convince people to get on board with our ideology? Now, I'll just, I, this segment is going about a bit longer than I thought, but I'll, I'll, I'll underline that with something here. Later down in the article, it says, uh, this is Faye Johnstone being quoted again. The fear is often exacerbated by the racism and xenophobia faced by racialized and migrant parents. Those relationships with their children are often undermined by dominant culture values of assimilation. So the hegemony, okay? So the, 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 the far right hegemony right now is manipulating them, which is perhaps part of why some migrant communities were overrepresented in the 2023's anti-trans Million March demonstrations in Canada. So they can't understand that those yeah. people were probably there because this goes against their conservative or religious values. You can't understand that. So it's got to be manipulation by the, the it's got to be the patriarchy conservative hegemony that is manipulating them into behaving this way. And I just want to end my point here with my favorite quote from Sun Tzu. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb to every battle. And I feel like Faye Johnstone could really pay attention to this Sun Tzu quote, because I feel like Faye does not understand the people he so vehemently opposes. Indeed. Yeah. I wasn't aware you were a fan of the art of war. I'm not. I just I... like that quote. I think it sums it up. That's why I desperately try to understand and put myself in... Uh, the shoes of people that I don't understand or disagree with. Mm -hmm. I, I reread it again recently. It's it's a short read. Uh, you can actually get the whole thing online on YouTube and listen to it in audio. It's I think it's under an hour, but really a fantastic text uh, for strategic engagement. The the wisdom that you shared there is very reflective, uh, you know, and consistent through the whole thing. Uh, never get into a never never get into a war. That you don't already know that you can win, basically. Don't put yourself well, in these a. Ideologues are never bothering to actually understand the people that they're opposing. Like, that's so clear because they themselves follow this idea of solidarity where everybody has to think the same. They expect that other people that they're opposed to also all exactly think the same. And when they don't, they come up with all these reasons why. And they're so yeah. off the mark that you are, you are setting yourself up to lose because you are yeah. not even trying to understand your enemy, you're just shouting at them, denouncing them. And even if you're going to change tactic, apparently you're still not understanding who you view as your enemy. So that is yeah. it that you're bound to lose. There's something in, uh, in, in European history that we called the divine right of Kings. And that was a, a, a justification for the power of monarchy in, uh, in Europe, but in, in the same context as Sun Tzu, um, they have something called the, that they refer to as the mandate of heaven. And the mandate of heaven is bestowed upon the individual of virtue and honor. Uh, and it's a responsibility to lead and protect their people or to lead uh, people in, into conflict or, or uh, to defend themselves. 
And uh, the thing that they have different from the divine right of kings is that you can lose the mandate of heaven if you're an asshole. Like it's it's not automatic. You have to behave in particular ways, and what trans activists ultimately yeah, are going to have kings can be deposed if they're not e exactly the right. Yeah, there's a there's a Confucian expression that translates as father, father, minister, minister, uh, king, king, lord, whatever it is, and and the equivalence is um, you know the title and virtue in those uh, in those levels. Anyway, uh, I'm. Uh, I wax philosophical occasionally, and I really love that Eastern philosophy and how it applies. Faye's got to figure out that you can't control people. You can't make people believe what you want them to believe, no matter what you do. There's another little wisdom piece I'll close out on. In, um, I think a lot of readers of our generation and and you know baby boom generation have come across uh, Stephen Jay Covey. He was a well-known uh, management consultant. And uh, what was it he used to say? And he observed that in generations past, and I think this kind of has to do with community size, that there was a character ethic that we lived by. And that was when we could do business by handshake, a high trust kind of environment. And, and he, then he observed as we got into the 80s and 90s that things were shifting into a personality ethic, which was to use kind of like tricks of... Um, of social manipulation to be able to put forward a persona in order to influence and, and get what you want. And we've moved now, I think, into uh, a victim and oppressor ethic or a victim's ethic uh, as the, as a fairly dominant way of, of trying to interact with the world. And we can see with Faye uh, how that's even he's realizing it's not working. Now, the last segment uh, was we're going to talk about drops in enrollments in Ontario public schools. Now, I got a call two and a half weeks ago from someone inside the the Ottawa system who was giving me an update on back to school, and and he said there's going to be news in a couple of weeks about an unexpected drop in the number of students in the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, the OCDSB, and a couple of things have happened in this past week. Uh, one is that those numbers have come out. In Ottawa, uh, the story is about a drop, 1,130 students less than expected. It's the second year in a row. It's a per How many students-ish total at the board? Like, like how, how much of a drop is 1,000? 1 1.6%. Okay. So it's about 72,000 or lo low 70,000 students in the, in the public system. Last year in September in Ottawa, the drop was 1,600 below projections. Now they made up some ground through the year and by the sort of second evaluation period in in January they you know the the delta was only about 700 students but it's 13,000 to 14,000 dollars per student in funding. So what that means is they have to sh shuffle classrooms. They've got to uh, get rid of uh, what they call FTEs, which stands for full-time equivalents. So they've got to lay people off or they've got to stop uh, working with uh, temporary and, and you know, uh, casual uh, teachers or, you know, that sort of thing. And kids' classrooms have to get mashed together or, or things like that. Now, my friend told me that some of the most dramatic drops were in kindergarten, like in some cases, only half of the number of kindergarten kids showed up in September. What's the population of Ottawa doing? Is that reflecting the actual change of population or is that... An, an population of Ottawa is growing. Um, and another, and, and as you mentioned that, in Waterloo, uh, I was uh, piqued to this by Mike Ramsey posting on Twitter, who was saying, you know, our population is growing, but our numbers of enrollment are shrinking. And the, their news this week was not so much the drop in enrollment, but the, oh, having gosh. to shuffle, having to shuffle classrooms. And both Mike Ramsey, uh, a trustee from Waterloo, and my friend here in Ottawa, speculated about the causes. How do we figure out what the cause is? And Mike suggested exit interviews, but if the kids didn't show up in the first place, you can't really interview I'm the parents for. 
parents and families about why they're not enrolling. So that's interesting. Okay. Right. So, so I tried that's to think about it this week. That's a good question. How? Uh, what are some of the factors? Yeah. Uh, so we know that in Waterloo, um, Chris Byros Fernandez has been doing a, a great job um, uh, and uh, helping to organize parents around uh, learning pods. She was on our summit in uh, January as a as one of the community um, uh, engagement um, sort of testimonials. And so learning pods, collaborative homeschooling with other parents, uh, different models for, for homeschooling. I think people are thinking more about that. Since last October, it's been harder to have conversations with people in the Muslim community. But I was getting information from Muslims when I was running for school trustee that they just don't um, like one one dad pulled his kids out and sent them back to Egypt. Oh, so they're uh, not being manipulated by the far right conservative white supremacists <laughs> so they're so they're not being told that they're trans and they can be the other gender and and this uh this you know western uh, progressive deconstructionist mindset doesn't infiltrate uh you know and and, and bridge but itself some on, of the on his... more ideological stuff in the boards are insulting their personal familial values <laughs> Exactly, and, and religious right. values. The other thing, as he said, and I can speak to this from my own experience, we have a terrible education system. Like, and it's been declining, you know, over decades. The The other thing that Some came out this week... The current trend in teaching methods may have something to do with that. Right. So uh, the EQAO scores also came out this week. EQAO, EQAO is the standardized testing for students in grade three, grade six, I think grade nine and grade 12, um, that measures at, um, progress and capacity at certain stages. And I tried to go back 10 years or more and get some results. And I didn't have time to get that far down into the data, but only about 50%, it's 52%. I looked at Waterloo, I looked at TDSB, I looked at Ottawa Carlton District School Board and Ottawa Catholic School Board. Only 52% of kids in grade six are functioning at grade level or above for mathematics. Only half the class. And this is, you know, the solution to this, like they've tried in other places, uh, Toronto, a couple of years ago was talking about getting rid of these tests because they're they're racist. Uh, well, so, there's a school, so I think we know the solution. It's going to be really unpopular because the trends in, in uh, the theory of teaching pedagogy pedagogy is all been completely subs. It's just been consumed by radical methods, right? When I'm talking about yeah. radical methods, this is about emancipating the student, liberating the student. Teaching, social emotional them learning, are, yeah, yeah. The, giving them bringing social justice about all the hidden oppressions that they may be facing, and somehow this is supposed to elevate them because we don't need to focus on merit, we don't need to focus on individual achievement because that is old hat, that is white supremacist. But yeah. we know all this, we talk about it on the channel all the time. But there's certainly experiments in the West that show that this is, uh, if you get rid of this and go back to a, a more conservative way of teaching, which is down to. Uh, getting rid of all this ideology. So an example of this is the Michaela School in the UK, which have removed all of the ideological stuff, returned it to the, the principal of the school, whose name escapes me off the top of my head right now. Catherine Burble Singh. Thank you. Um, talks about essentially going back to what we would call going back to basics, right? Teaching the actual material, getting the phones out of school. There's a lot of strict... Uh, discipline. Holding kids accountable, be on time for class, sit yeah. up straight, do your homework. Is a very yeah, old-fashioned way of educating that was in a style that existed before all of the new radical pedagogy decided that it wanted to take over education, and they're doing really, really well. And so, what that what that shows, and this school is in a particularly deprived area of London. So, one of the arguments is, well, we can't do that. We need to teach them uh, about their oppression so that they can act against their oppression, and that's what the whole purpose of school. The reason we uh, there's a, a large justification for that has been. Well, these kids come from poor backgrounds or they're from minoritized or racialized communities and so on and so forth. And so we need to do this to help them. But this school that's doing, I think it's one of the number one, if not the number one school in the UK in a super deprived area that it, that is taken on uh, conservative because conservative values for education is probably a really good thing that you want to do. Um, but 
yeah, these these are poor kids. These are kids of immigrants. Their parents often don't speak English well or at at all. They don't, you know, they don't come from rich backgrounds. They don't live in rich neighborhoods. They have all these uh, barriers, what we would call systemic barriers that they have to face day in, day out. And yet they're doing better than just about anybody else. And it's, de- and it can, I mean, it's pretty obvious it's down to the values of the school who focus on education and actually empowering children with knowledge and, and uh, self-reliance and duty and uh, hard work and not the ideology, which is not helping them. And so I, we don't have anything like this that that I'm aware of in Canada, but it'd be interesting to see. Well, there's a classical school in uh, Alberta, and her name escapes me. Uh, she has opened two so point, schools. Point, yeah, so the point was that it's not your, it's not the poverty. It's not the fact that right. you come from a so-called racialized background. It's not any of these identity factors or socioeconomic factors. It really is down to how you educate someone, how you teach someone. And we used to do that really, really well. And so when you say things like our education is terrible, I think we need to start looking at teaching methods because absolutely even works out really well. This is a bit esoteric on education policy, but there's something in Ontario that we refer to as the right to read. It's, it was a decision from the Ontario human rights commission that uh, a certain methodology of teaching uh, had to be um, enacted because it worked, which is kind of weird for the human. We started with human rights tribunal kind of getting weaponized, but this was actually a strong decision saying, you know, these methods, phonics, sounding out words, you know, learning, learning in a, in a, in a traditional style of reading produces better reading results. And that is a human right. And, and you're failing yeah. to provide service to, to all students by failing to, to in, in engage this kind of teaching. And the union activists are opposed to this, where they're normally aligned with the Human Rights Tribunal and Commission. This is, this is one that they're ignoring. Uh, it was a topic in the last school board elections two years ago. Still plenty of education uh, um, uh, teachers not using it. And here in Ottawa, although I have... You know, some respect for the new director of education. He is moving classes towards uh, more wokeness in terms of their yeah, structure. And it's, it's inevitably going to go in that direction unless someone has a very strong backbone and says no and does yeah. something. Because we're not, eval- I mean, are teachers even being evaluated properly? You know, are we looking at their methods? Well, no, because there's a court case in 2020, 2019 where the ETFO and the CCLA took the Ministry of Education to court over repealing the sex ed curriculum. And in that court case, like I keep repeating on this channel, it very explicitly states that the Minister of Education has given full professional authority to all the teachers in their own classrooms to have professional judgment to teach what they want, how they want, with whatever resources that they want in the classroom, with whatever methods, whatever whatever tactics with other theories they want to use so long as they test according to the curriculum age so for example if the, let's say I'm, I'm making this up here let's say there's like level three literacy has to be passed in grade three well you can teach level three literacy at any age at any time with any material so long as you're tested in grade three that's the same with gender identity and so if you are so inclined from your own education you think you're changing the world you've read a lot of henry Giroux, and you feel like you are you know, teacher or educator as intellectual, and it is your job to liberate people, and you're going to be a change agent in the world, and you're going to use all of your your teaching, your radical um, educator uh, theories and ideas, well, you're going to go do it. You're going to do it as much as possible. And if they're not being held accountable for the outcomes of their classrooms, and same with principals, same with the directors of education and all this stuff, if they're not being held accountable as the grades are going down and they're blaming, oh, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough resources, oh, look, we're losing all our staff and it's all because of the government. There needs to be, uh, they really need to start looking inwards. What are we doing that could potentially exactly. solve the problem? Exactly. I'm not seeing any of that. <laughs> no, there's no, there's no capacity for self-reflection um, and they they want to push their agenda. There's a similar pattern here to Faye Johnstone. This, this is a belief that we have. We're doing it this way. We're we're gonna bully uh, people and bullshit people who uh, criticize us because we we know that we're right and they're wrong, and uh, and we get the results that we get. Now on yeah. the other side of kind of you know 
pushing their own agenda. They also have sets of metrics that are um, that are corrupt. Um, so they have now, DEI, I, KPIs, and metrics, and so on and so forth at the school board level. Yes. So, um, for example, discipline. And this was another news article this week of violence in Toronto uh, TDSB high schools because there's no there's no consistent discipline. There's a guy named Charlie Munger. I think we're all familiar with um, Warren Buffett. Well, Charlie Munger was uh, Warren Buffett's right-hand man. And for a long time, Buffett was the richest man in the world, made, made his money in investing. And Charlie Munger said that you get what you incentivize. This is pretty, pretty standard a reality. If, you, if you're in a business system or uh, any kind of bureaucratic system, when you incentivize something and you attach reward to that incentive, or you attach penalty, then you get what you incentivize. The problem is, if you have dumb incentives, you get dumb outcomes. And uh, we have these incentives in the education system, and I think this is one of the reasons why parents are, you know, they're waking up to this, they're, they're either withdrawing their kids and homeschooling, they're doing something else, or they're not enrolling them at all, like like uh, the, the guy that I know who sent his kids out of country, um, that... Principals get measured on their disciplinary record. And if there are a disproportionate number of black students getting disciplined or suspended, then that goes against the principal's uh, advancement um, uh, prospects. So the incentivization is to not discipline black students. Now, we can discipline white students and suspend them, uh, which happens. There was a school in Ottawa, suspended 11 boys in grade 7 for 20 school days last year. I won't get into the details of that, but none of them were were at least uh, uh, defended minorities, although they were they were some of them were from minority groups. And and you get this sort of this system where the kids know it and and well, the police are getting kids, it's not just allowing kids to behave poorly but it's also all the other children who are watching this right so yep kids, kids notice they're going to notice yep. that they recognize they the corruption in the system they recognize the double standards the, the 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 pathological kids recognize that they can do whatever they want and nothing's going to happen to them all kinds of stories of of elementary school students having one disruptive kid in the class who's a minority who's throwing chairs around who can't be disciplined it's ruining the the education uh environment for all the other students but the administrators feel that they're entirely powerless to do it so we have we have systemic problems in the education system and we saw a couple of symptoms of that yeah, this week and, might and not be one of them though agreed agreed yeah um, I, I think that's it from us today. I'll make sure that we post all of the, uh, all of the materials that you can go look at. You can follow up on, uh, for yourself in, in the description. So there'll be all of that there, but yeah, that's it for me. All right. Have a super week, everybody. Thanks for watching again. Make sure you like, and subscribe. And, uh, if, uh, if you like share it with others, post it on social media, let people know that we're, what we're talking about and, and, uh, that we're providing some resources and insights and, Leave us a comment. Have a great weekend, Shannon. You too, Melanie. Happy Thanksgiving.